Are there uh, are there any logistical questions at this point for me? So I'll give you some emails about problems with the cheat. I'll try to get to those uh, tomorrow, or maybe later today. Um, otherwise, where are we? We've been sort of um, getting into a discussion of, of chapter four, which is a bit behind. Um, which means that you've got to read the textbook if you want to do all the homeworks. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but uh, we'll keep on moving forward and try to get caught up on all these, these thoughts and this theory. I spent a bit too long talking about how to keep your money safe last time, but I was having fun. So um, that is part of my utility function. And therefore, you ought to expect it. We can talk about. About the monetary base. As being sum, the sum of both currency and reserves. Now, currency is money out there floating around. Reserves are the money that's sitting in banks. Okay. We are moving more and more towards a cashless society, are we not? <clears throat> How much money do you have on you right now in cash? I doubt if I could put together $500 in this room right now. I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I, I might not even be able to get $200 in this room right now from you all. Everybody over their wallet and see how much they got. I thought it was going to get mugged on the way out of the classroom. <laughs> we don't need currency in our pockets so much anymore. It kind of makes it easier and more difficult, or just different for the government to engage in the, the supply of money. A lot of American currency is not in America. A lot of US government money is not in the United States. A lot of it's in Ecuador. Ecuador is a dollarized economy. They don't have their own provision of money. They just use ours. North Korea has a lot of American currency. They love cash. Because then they can buy stuff from other places in the world where there exist sanctions against them buying stuff and nobody can tell because they bought it with cash. Within American society, who, who likes cash a lot? Kinds of people tend to do most of their transactions in cash. Yeah, criminals, criminals, drug dealers, older people, older people. It's 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 odd, but true. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's you know, I've got all kinds of theories about that. Very few of them are economic in nature. Um, okay. Now, the, the money that a bank keeps on hand, right, it has all this money that's been deposited with it. But that deposit does not appear up here. Instead, of the money that it has on deposit, it's only keeping some portion of it on reserve. You can call the amount that is on reserve the reserve ratio. Just the percentage of deposits that are on reserve. We can also think about the currency deposit ratio. And we'll call that CR, and that is currency over deposits. In that case, we'd say that the amount of money that exists, or one measure of the amount of money that exists, is currency plus deposits, which is to be equals. Right. The amount of money that exists is the amount of money that's out there flowing around currency plus that's that which is in banks 
in other positive. And then we've said that uh, the base is equal to currency plus reserves. If we take the amount of money divided by the base, what we're doing is we're taking C plus D divided by C plus R. We can divide all of this by D, at least the whole right hand side. We get C over D plus D over D, all over C over D plus R over D. And this C over D term is what we've defined as the, the currency deposit ratio. D over D is one. Um, so this is this. And then reserve over deposits is our reserve ratio. So then we can re-express M over B as C or CR plus one all over CR plus RR, the currency reserve ratio plus the reserve ratio. Then we can think about well, how, what happens if one of these things changes. For example, if the reserve ratio goes down, if the reserve ratio decreases, what happens to the quantity of money? The reserve ratio is in the denominator. So the denominator of this term gets smaller, which means that the whole term gets larger, so the amount of money increases. As the reserve ratio gets lower, the amount of money increases. It seems to be intuitive also because as, as banks hold less of their currency on reserve and loan more of it out, then there is more currency outflowing floating around. So if the Fed wanted to increase the quantity of money, it could do so by decreasing its required reserve ratio. <clears throat> Typically, uh, this was a primary mechanism for the Fed to influence monetary policy. Now, remember, they're only holding a certain amount on reserve because they're required to through regulation because they would loan it all out in, uh, because they are protected from, from bank failure because there is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that's created a moral hazard. So this policy instrument became one tool that the Fed had in its arsenal for influencing the quantity of money in the market. Similarly, <clears throat> if you decrease the credit reserve ratio, the, the currency deposit ratio, right? then you'll have more in reserves, but both the numerator and the denominator are affected. So if these both go down, what happens overall? We tend to see that overall monetary base increases. That is, this ratio goes up if there's more currency relative to what's on deposit. So there's uh, more money flowing around. Banks are making more loans. Banks are making more loans. Money is a, a ready to spend asset. One way of describing money is to say that it is a ready to spend asset. I have a uh, I have three different colored markers here. I'm ready to buy something with them. However, there's a very limited market for them. Some people might want a purple marker and I don't have one. Suppose we can mix the blue and the red together and get purple, right? But I don't wanna make purple in the classroom. Uh, so, 
So having an asset that somebody is ready and willing to buy is a money. When we think about money, we're going to introduce uh, a concept called the quantity theory of money. This has its roots all the way back in the works of David Hume. Uh, it's been more recently, although not very recently, recovered by Milton Friedman. And what Milton Friedman found was that there's a relationship between or among the price level, the level of output, the quantity of money, and the velocity of money. He described it this way. The quantity of money times the velocity of money is equal to the prices of stuff times the amount of stuff that exists. Now, both of these would be matrices of the different prices and quantities that exist in the actual marketplace. Notice that this side of the equation is also a good description of GDP. Well, in that case, then, quantity of money times the velocity of money must also be an expression of GDP. The money that gets spent is received by somebody. <clears throat> One step forward for this theory was to assume that velocity is relatively constant in the short run. Velocity is the number of times that a dollar bill changes hands over the course of a year. Somebody, uh, my brother-in-law was talking to me about pennies. He was asking how long until we stop making pennies? After all, the cost of making a penny is more than one cent. <coughs> Why do we still have pennies if it costs more than a penny to make one? Well, that's the cost of production, but it's not the value in use for a penny. A penny gets used more than once, typically, doesn't it? Typically, a penny will get used over and over and over again. Although, as we move, again, more towards a cashless society, how often do you just round up when you buy something? How, many, how often do you leave the pennies with the teller or with the person at the grocery store? More and more I do. I don't, I don't want those pennies. They take up space in my pocket. They don't really do anything for me. A penny saved is not necessarily a penny earned because I have to carry it around and I'm probably just gonna lose it. How long till we get rid of pennies? And if we get rid of pennies, what are we gonna move towards? Are we gonna get rid of nickels and dimes and quarters too? Can you see that happening readily? Maybe, although we often use quarters for, for buying a lot of things. There's a lot of machines that still take quarters and don't take credit cards or dollars. Maybe we'll move towards only having dollars. Would you be unwilling to pay $2 for a bottle of soda instead of $1.75 on campus? I don't know. We might just move the decimal once, we might move it twice. We might move it to just being quarters and dollars. That would maybe confuse some people. Why don't we have tenths of a dollar? I don't know. But we a dollar a dollar changes hands many times. It doesn't have to actually be a dollar that changes hands. You go and you uh, you get paid for your work. Okay, so there's the dollar flowing into your bank account, and you take that money and you go and you pay for gas. Okay, now that money is in the 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 gas station's account, and that gas station buys its supplies. So then the money moves to the supplier to the gas station. And then that money moves somewhere else. Some of the money that you spend at the gas station was paid to the person who works at the gas station who turns around and buys something with it elsewhere in the economy. The rate at which money moves through the economy is the velocity of money. And that's helpful to remember because it's helpful to recognize that GDP is not a stock measure, but rather GDP is a flow measure. The distinction between a stock and a flow, if you've got a bathtub, you fill it with water, the stock is how much money you have in the, in the tub. 
The flow is the rate at which water is going in and or out of the tub. Now, now, as we become more productive, GDP might be increasing, but some of the expenditures of GDP might be on things that hold their value for a long time. Durable goods, capital, or just wealth in whatever context that might mean. So then the overall wealth of the economy, the stock, might be increasing while, while the flow right, can increase or decrease. Uh, and this is GDP. The faster that money moves through an economy, the faster that a dollar bill moves through an economy, the less money you need in order to obtain the same number of transactions. So as velocity increases, you need less actual money, either in physical or in a digital sense. And there have been many innovations over the last few decades that have increased the velocity of money. It used to be that almost all transactions were done in cash or check. Well, the introduction of checking greatly increased the, the velocity of money. I remember when the first ATM machines redundant, isn't it? ATM is automatic teller machine. I remember when the first ATMs were, were, were put in place in, at banks. It used to be only at banks. You have to go to the bank, to the ATM to get your money out of deposit. <clears throat> now, now, now you have debit cards. That greatly increases the velocity of money, how easy it is to spend the money. And you have Venmo and Zelle. Those greatly increase the rate at which are you guys using Venmo a lot right now? You guys use Venmo? I use Venmo a good bit. And, um, I, I could use it more. Okay. You guys use Apple Pay or Samsung Pay? Does that work pretty well? Yeah. Okay. I'm still figuring it out. Okay. Now we take this basic equation that n times v equals p times y. And we recognize that uh, in both expressions, we're talking about money and prices expressed in nominal terms. So these are both expressions of nominal GDP. Now we might wanna know whether an economy is growing. If an economy is growing, then the percentage change of output will be positive. Notice that percentage change in output is controlling for price. There's actually more stuff. So the way that we try to identify whether an economy is growing or not is by looking at real GDP growth, right? So that would be expressed as the percentage change in output. Okay. Well, how would I take the rest of this expression and, and adjust it so that I can solve for the percentage change in growth? We employ uh, what is called Euler's theorem. What Euler's theorem says is that if we take m times v equals p times y, and we take the percentage change of each variable. A small percentage change in the quantity of money should have the same small percentage change on the right-hand side. And so, not in terms of, of, of multiplication, but in terms of addition. So the relationship between these variables is additional rather than multiplicative. There's a, correct, there's a better word for that. So this is approximately true. It's not exact, but it's approximately true. We use this, though, as our way of thinking through a lot of problems that have to do with money. Now, 
we recognize that if the quantity of money doesn't change and the velocity of things changes, if the price of things fall, we can buy more stuff. <clears throat> right? In that case, nominal GDP would not change. A real GDP would have changed. Okay. We can take this model and say the same thing. If, if there's no change in the quantity of money and there's no change in the velocity of money, whatever percentage prices go up by, then the same, there must be a decrease in the quantity of stuff, percentage change of what there is, okay? This term, percentage change in price, we recognize as inflation. We'll often uh, express inflation simply by using pi, the standard for inflation. The rest of these variables, we might put M arrow plus V arrow. And the arrows are just notation to indicate percentage change in. This last term, percentage change in Y, right? that's real GDP growth rate. We might continue to express that as percentage change in Y or, or Y with an arrow over it. Or notation of first versus. When we think about a change in money, a change in the quantity of money, if we adopt the assumption that velocity in the short run is relatively constant, that new innovations in the rate of which exchanges can take place are relatively constant, and if output is fixed by exogenous forces, right, the quantity that gets output that gets made of something right, has more to do with real factors, actual ability to produce more stuff, then an increase in money will often evidence itself by a change in prices. So if there's been a rate of change growth in the quantity of money being supplied to a market, we'll often observe inflation. <clears throat> Bill and Friedman articulated this by saying that Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That might not always be true, though. You could have a shock to output, massive decrease in productivity. Like, I don't know, if you send half of your workers home for a year, the amount of stuff that gets produced might go down. If the amount of money and the, the velocity of money remains the same, but the amount of stuff goes down and you have the same amount of money chasing more goods or fewer goods, then we ought to expect prices to go up. So we'll see an increase in the overall price level. Now, is that due to activity by the government in terms of supply of money? Not necessarily. However, if you also have an increase in the supply of money, at the same time that productivity goes down, well then, you might observe a lot of inflation or an inflation rate higher than people expected. I'm not 100% certain that that is an explanation of what's going on, but it is barking up the right tree. We can take this expression and do a little bit more with it. If we hold velocity constant, then in our expression, And in our expression, we could just say m equals pi plus y. And, and we could rearrange this and say that inflation is equal to the change in money minus the change in output. If we target a nominal rate of price growth you could get something where there is a, a predictable rate of inflation that controls for both money and output. 
We'll get to a nominal GDP target later on in the semester. Yeah. How do real balances affect demand? Or what my money can buy? We take our original expression L over P. We ask, we want to focus on the demand side. And having rearranged our equation, we find that this is equal to one over V times Y. If if output goes up, then the demand for money goes up. If the velocity goes up, then the demand for money goes down because velocity is in the denominator. Notice that in this expression, there is no interest rate being discussed. There's no use of the interest rate. There's no price of money. How can you have a demand for something but no, no price? We have to ask yourself, well, why do we want money? We want money so that we can engage in transactions. We want money so that we can spend it. We also might want money as a precaution. <clears throat> we might want to hold cash as compared to deposits at the bank if we are not trusting of our banks. This is what happened to our great grandparents. They lived through the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, the banks failed. They weren't trustworthy. So people kept their cash at home, which is interesting because that had a deflationary effect on prices, such that if you had $100 at home today, prices were falling over time, which would mean that next year, that $100 would buy you more than it would buy you today which gave everybody an incentive not to spend their money. And as people stopped spending their money, right, they stopped buying things that caused unemployment to go up. And as they stopped buying things, other people didn't have money to spend, so they kept their money, whatever money they had. And we had something like the perfect storm where economic activity massively decreased in a relatively short amount of time. But the main outcome of that is that a lot of people kept cash under their mattresses or at home or buried somewhere. My great aunt Ann moved from Long Island to Florida when I was probably eight or nine years old. And the whole family showed up to help her move because everybody knew that under the TV and in between the pages of a book and under the mattress and in a secret compartment under the silverware drawer, this woman had hidden gobs of cash. It was like the banana stand. Just cash hid in there, that crazy. This was very common for that generation. You might also, might also want to have cash to, to, to speculate. All right, so you can buy assets in the short run. We need to think about then people's demand for money in terms of the output of things. And we're going to instead say that the demand for money is some function of the interest rate and output. Now, if the interest rate goes down, how does that affect your demand for money? On the one hand, if the interest rate goes down, then you don't want to save as much money because you're not going to earn as much saving it somewhere. So then if the interest rate goes down, your demand for money will actually go up. You're not going to earn as much by saving it. So you'll spend it more readily. So then you'll spend more. So then the sign on the interest rate is negative. As the as output increases, what happens to your demand for money? If there's more things to buy, you want more money. Because you want to buy the stuff. Okay. So we end up with
a money demand function in terms of the interest rate that is downward sloping. Now I've used nominal interest rate. I'll just briefly remind us that this is the not adjusted for inflation interest rate. The, the real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus the rate of inflation. As inflation goes up, the nominal interest rate goes up with it. The real interest rate is rather constant. Real interest rate is determined by subjective time preferences. So our real interest rate tends not to vary that much. So then we, when we, when we make our plans, we're making our plans based upon some expected rate of inflation. This is also expressed as pi e sometimes, expected rate of inflation. Well, then, when I, I think about the money demand of equation, oops. by the way, why do I have P in the denominator here? That makes it real instead of nominal. I have to say, well, what's actually happening is that the demand for money is influenced by some function of real interest rate plus the expected rate of inflation and output. As expectations about inflation change, that will immediately affect changes in demand for money. You don't actually have to observe inflation happening. An expectation of it changing will result in a change in the demand for money right away. I asked this question in my intro class the other day. I said, okay, in the market for TVs, What happens if you expect the price of TVs to go up in the near future? You're gonna buy it today. You'll buy it today. And so will everybody else who also has the same expectations, right? So then that causes a shift in the demand for TVs. What happens as a result? The price of TVs goes up. In a way, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? Or another way of saying that is to say that markets clear based not upon current knowledge, but also knowledge about the future. Any information that can be known about the market or the economy will be baked into the prices of goods and services of the economy from the very beginning. We call that the efficient markets hypothesis. You guys remember that? Right? Any information that is publicly available will be baked into the price. So as soon as information becomes available, there's no longer an arbitrage opportunity, an opportunity to get rich quick. If you get there before anybody else does, you might have an opportunity. In the long run, expectations about inflation can't fool people. People respond to changes in the real inflation rate. They update their expectations regarding inflation. That means that when the government changes the rate of inflation by changing the quantity supply of money, you can only fool people in the short run. Otherwise, otherwise it expects that people have what we call rational expectations about what the government's going to do. So it used to be that people thought that by increasing the quantity of supply of money, you can increase inflation and at the same time increase the amount of employment or decrease unemployment. So there was this inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. All right, we want more workers to have jobs. Let's raise inflation. 
But that only works if the inflation is unexpected, unanticipated by, by workers and by employers. And it only lasts until people do update their expectations. We show that in our, our basic aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. Where we have a long run aggregate supply curve, which is our actual capacity to produce an aggregate demand curve and a short run aggregate supply curve. If the government increases the supply of money in the short run, it causes a shift in aggregate demand. And for a minute, people will be fooled. For a minute, people will be fooled, but they're fooled by prices. As people, as people observe that prices have gone up, they update their expectations such that the new short run aggregate supply curve will intersect where people have updated their expectations about inflation to have risen to. And this will continue to ratchet itself up until we reach a new inflation rate that is consistent with the supply of money. This. It's consistent with the increase in, in the supply of money. And we're back at our real level of being able to produce. The idea of rational expectations was a bit of a surprise in economics, which is a bit of a surprise to me that it should be a surprise. But it, it only really started to develop in the 1970s as a way of counteracting uh, other theories about macroeconomic activity. It used to be, be that really people did believe that by increasing inflation, you could decrease unemployment. The question is how rational are people? Or another way of asking that is, you think people are stupid? And, and I tend to prefer not to think that people are stupid. Prevailing evidence to the contrary. So I'm going to think this through again. M, the supply of money is exogenous. Done at the will of the Fed, whatever they want to do. The real interest rate adjusts such that savings is equal to investment. The real interest rate is the rate at which by borrowers and lenders come to mutual agreement in transactions. Output is defined as being determined by capital and labor, which we have in fixed proportions. So then output is also constant. So then price adjusts in response to changes in the supply of money such that M over P is equal to L of I and Y, framed by the equilibrium of the market. So the, the bottom line is that any percentage change in money leads to a similar percentage change in price, that is the quantity theory of money as articulated by Mother Friedman. Again, we are, we are glad to have this framework because it allows us to play with things. <coughs> if this equation is true, then if we hold the real interest rate and output and the supply of money constant, any expectation about inflation increase will result in an increase in the nominal interest rate Will call, which will cause the demand for money to go down. How? Well, because prices will go up. Okay. 
there we have basically our quantity theory of money. I want to say anything else about that. All right, um, I'm going to wind down there now for today. Uh, are there any uh, are there any other questions for me today? Uh, we'll meet again on Friday, barring you know, some of the snow I expect that we'll be open. Ball State has a pretty good reputation of yeah. never canceling classes. Yeah. So, so. I look forward to trudging through the snow this week here. All right, thank you.